Um, this talk is about my PhD thesis project, and I thought I recorded for um, anyone who's interested in the topic, who works in the field currently, or who wants to operationalize uh, the software that I developed or developed similar software. And um, yeah, so my, my project was about developing a computer vision pipeline for the automated inspection of large scale photovoltaic plants, as shown here. And um, in this talk, I will quickly give a motivation for why we would want to do. Uh, inspections on these plants. Then I will give a short overview of the core problem that was solved in this uh, thesis. And then I will talk um, in detail about the developed computer vision pipeline, um, the state of the art, the developed methods and the core results. Um, then we will conclude this and uh, I will briefly mention the software that I developed in the course of this project. And finally give uh, an outlook which would be interesting for anyone working in this field who wants to improve um, yeah, the software or uh, build the next or go to the, to the next step in this. Um, so yeah, first of all, why, why would we want to do uh, inspection of large scale photovoltaic plants? So um, it's mostly because solar PV is getting very popular. So currently we have about 775 gigawatt peak deployed. Um, or actually in 2020 we had 70, 175 gigawatt peak deployed, which uh, is about 3.2% share of the global electricity production. And the International Energy Agency in a conservative scenario um, predicts that another 940 gigawatt peak will be added until 2026. Uh, so 160 gigawatt peak annually about. And um, these plants are massive. I mean, the, the largest ones uh, currently are about 550 square kilometer in size. So they have millions of modules and components, cables, connectors. Um, and of course, they can fail, as shown here. So there is a whole spectrum of things that can go wrong in these plants. Um, burned out um, junction boxes like di uh, bypass diodes, uh, broken cable connectors, um, material degradation. Um, yeah, exposure to, to the elements like uh, hail, um, thermal cycles, um, mechanical load cycles through wind and whatever. And uh, yeah, studies have found that um, about 8% of all modules and 2% of all strings in these plants are affected and it costs about 6% average power loss. And um, yeah, we want to prevent, of course, these power losses and yield losses. And that's why we want to do inspection and to get identify these uh, failures and possibly repair or mitigate uh, the causes. And um, that's important to meet, help meet the investment targets of these plants to, to ensure the economic success of solar PV. And uh, because only if it's economically successful, it can uh, grow in future. And um, of course, it's also a safety aspect because in some cases, these uh, failures could cause fires. And um, especially if the plants are mounted on rooftops, we want to prevent that uh, from happening. So it's also a regulatory requirement in some cases. And also solar PV inspection is a future topic um, because currently we see a lot of new deployments. Uh, as can be seen from here, right? We currently see very new plants that uh, work well, um, but let them age for five to 10 years and the number of defects will increase. So inspection will become ever more important in the next coming years. Um, yeah, so as I said, these plants are massive in size, so we can't possibly manually inspect them. So what's being done very often is infrared tomography with uh, small consumer market drones, uh, such as this DJI drone. And um, IR tomography is popular because it has several um, advantages over other techniques. So um, <clears throat> for instance, it's non-contact, so it doesn't interfere with the plant operation. You just image the plant with a thermal camera, and then you will see the anomalous modules um, as having an increased temperature. And um, that's as opposed, for example, to electroluminescence or photoluminescence imaging, where we have to uh, reverse power the plant or shine with very uh, bright LEDs onto the modules. Um, it's safer and, as I said, it doesn't interfere with the plant operation. Also, it allows to record during daytime because we need a solar, uh, strong solar irradiance of about 600 watt per square meter. Um, so that's advantage here is that you don't have to record during the night as for EL or PL, so you don't need to pay nighttime surcharges or get special work permits for night operation. Um, and infrared tomography is also sensitive to both module and system anomalies, so um, anomalies that affect individual modules, but also entire parts of the plant, like enti uh, entire strings or arrays. 
And uh, these small drones are popular because they are relatively low cost. I mean, you get this for about 20,000 euro. Um, so that's as compared to a helicopter or other equipment, very cheap. Um, they can be fully automated. You can do waypoint flights, um, and they help this. They help to achieve high throughputs of about uh, 48,000 modules, which is equivalent to about 11 megawatt peak per hour. And that's about 10 to 15 times faster than walking or ground-based uh, systems. Yeah, so th this is how it looks like um, when you when we record our data. So we fly in this case manually over the plant. We scan the rows uh, sequentially. Then we get this kind of footage now in RGB and now in infrared, thermal infrared. So you see this one has a slightly lower frame rate of about nine hertz. Um, you can now later see some here yeah, some anomalies popping up. Um, yeah, this is the kind of footage we work with. And that leads us to the problem statement of this project. Um, yeah, which is basically this uh, large amounts of challenging data being produced. So the data is challenging because it's uh, of long duration, it's highly repetitive and has no visual reference points. So it's uh, yeah, impossible for a human to manually work with this kind of data. But instead, um, we can use computer vision to, to automate this procedure. And what do we want to achieve here? Yeah, we want to actually get an overview map that can be easily interpreted by a human. So we want to get a map in which we uh, highlight anomalous modules for further inspection or even directly for repair. Um, I said this can be done with computer vision and that's also what I did in this uh, thesis. So as I said, I developed this um, computer vision pipeline um, and it can be broken down into uh, some subtasks. And also the following presentation will be grouped into these subtasks. For every subtask, I will talk about the state of the art, my method um, and the core results. So in the beginning is the uh, data acquisition. It's about planning the flights, acquiring the video data. Um, yeah. Then the next step would be to, to identify in the video where do we have PV modules. Um, so which pixels represent PV modules. Then we would have to georeference the modules, so identify which of these, um, yeah, where in the PV plant are these uh, modules localized or located. Um, the next step would be to identify which of the modules have um, some anomalies. Are they healthy or do they yeah, show some kind of possible defects or which uh, are visible through thermal anomalies. And then finally we would report this on a map as shown earlier to, to allow targeted repairs and um, yeah, give an overview of the plant's health state. So we start with the ah, sorry. the first. Uh, so in this, this thesis, I published uh, three papers. So um, the first one is about the entire pipeline. So I implemented every single step of the pipeline, kind of the initial solution to everything. Um, then the second publication, I looked in depth into the anomaly detection. I spotted a problem here, which is called domain shift, and I proposed a solution to it. Um, and then finally, in the last publication, I um, reiterate on the module localization method, largely improved this, and also developed a new anomaly detection method. And um, the following will be mostly about these two papers, because I said the third one is an improvement of the first one, so I will not go too much into the details of the first method. Um, yeah. So let's start with the data acquisition, how this works. So um, I said it's about planning and executing the flight and recording video. So um, we are relatively flexible here. We don't really make assumptions about the plant layout, um, but it does help to just sequentially scan along the rows. You don't have to be sequential, but it just makes it easier to deal with the data later, sort the data. Um, you can uh, fly basically in a configuration where the row passes horizontally through the frame, where it passes vertically through the frame. You can also scan multiple rows at a time. We test it with two and three rows, as I will show later also. Um, yeah, that's about it. We, we did uh, manual flights but no one uh, stops you from 
planning a waypoint flight with uh, your preferred flight uh, yeah, controller and flying uh, automatically. The idea here is that you can use the method both for small PV plants to perform ad hoc inspections, like you don't want to like uh, do a full blown flight planning for uh, yeah, a plant that, that is just uh, yeah, a few hundred modules. Uh, you just want to go there, fly your drone quickly five minutes over the plant and be done. But on the other hand, when you have very large plants with uh, thousands of modules, you want to probably be able to do flight planning and automatically execute the flight. So it is both possible with this method. Um, now to the module detection. Um, again, that's the task of identifying which uh, pixels in each frame represent a PV module and which ones not, uh, background or irrelevant components. Um, so here the state of the art in this. So as, again, this I'm not the first one who does this uh, topic. There were other works before me. Mostly they look into individual aspects. So they propose either a module detection method, an anomaly detection method, or a localization method. There are a couple of works that also look into integrating everything. Um, but I will now look into the yeah, aspect of module detection here. So we see a lot of works using uh, classic image processing methods, such as uh, Kenny Edge detection, hoof line transform, um, or also segmentation by thresholding with fixed threshold values, adaptive threshold values. Um, the little problem I have with these works is that they don't really um, use a lot of data to build the methods and test the methods. Um, I will show the numbers later, but um, that makes it a bit questionable if these methods actually generalized and in, in practice to multiple plants, um, because these PV plants have they can be quite different, uh, different, right? They have different modules, different layouts can be having grass in the background, asphalt, sand, uh, whatever. So I'm a bit skeptical if these methods actually work on, on these variety, high variety of plants. But then we see um, some new works using deep learning. Um, for instance, uh, one work used segmentic segmentation to remove the background or classify background versus PV modules in the foreground. Um, here the little problem is it wouldn't be applicable to our method because it can't distinguish individual PV modules. Um, then we also see um, object detection being used, like YOLO is popular here. Um, yeah, so th this one would give us axis aligned bounding boxes. Um, again, it's not so good for our case because we don't really get the accurate positions of the PV module corners because the, the boxes can be or are only aligned to the image axes. So it's that what's useful and that's also what we use um, as instant segmentation. So we get a bounding box for each PV module and also a pixel accurate uh, mask. And this one allows us to, to localize the module corners. Um, there are also a couple of works that use instant segmentation on, on entire tables and rows. But I think that's a bit problematic because it wouldn't generalize uh, if the row layout or table layout changes. Um, so again, that could be like multiple, um, it could be only like say two modules stacked vertically, but it could be also three or four stacked and this method would, either you train it on all these configurations, otherwise it wouldn't uh, generalize. Whereas here you only uh, identify individual PV modules and it doesn't really matter to the um, neural network how the global arrangement of these modules is. So this one is the way to go in my eyes. And that's, as I said, how we do it also. So this is now our method for the module detection. We first take our videos, we split the video into individual video frames because we work on a per frame basis. Uh, so for each frame we apply, um, in this case, a mask RCNN, um, out of not really modified very much. Um, yeah, just apply it to get the uh, module masks for each frame. Um, we did choose Mars RCNN because it just works well in practice. There are like mature implementations available, um, libraries like, um, yeah, the TensorFlow Object Detection API, if it's a bit outdated, maybe um, MM Detection has implementations for Mars RCNN. So yeah, we apply this, uh, get our mask for every module, for every frame. Um, and now we can actually harness the, um, because we have video frames with nine hertz, uh, so we can um, connect uh, the same or mask of the same PV module over subsequent video frames um, using a multi-object tracker. 
and this allows us then to crop out um, these regions. We rectify them with a homography to get a yeah, um, rectangular shaped module. And because of this tracking, we have multiple patches per module. And um, this allows us to do some more um, advanced analytics downstream because we have multiple patches available for the same module. It also allows us to, for example, filter out sun reflections that may occur. Um, and also makes let's, let's make more accurate predictions because we have just more images available for each module. And this is like how it looks like in video. So this is our input video. Then this is the individual detections of the PV modules and masks. And here the result of the tracking. So if you see these blue uh, numbers, they stay constant over the visibility of the respective module. Uh, and overall, we, we achieved a mean average precision of about 90%. Um, I, I know the number doesn't say much, but the results are sufficient. I mean, it's, the masks are accurate enough to allow us to skip any kind of post-processing. We just work directly with the output of mask RTN. Um, and again, this is um, useful because if we introduce post-processing, it would introduce heuristics again, and we're not sure how well they would generalize. And so it's good to just work out of the box with the results of the mask RCNN. <coughs> yeah, here in this experiment, so now come the results for the module detection. So in this experiment, we um, analyze just the amount of data that we need for training how that affects the overall mean average precision that's achieved. Also, what combinations of uh, training and test plans uh, would lead to what MAP. Um, and we found here, actually, the most or the only interesting aspect that we find here is that um, it makes a difference whether the modules are in landscape or portrait mode. Um, so you need to take that into account while training. Um, we also found that, uh, I mean, that's not very surprising, but the, num the more data you include in the training set, the, the higher the MAP that's achieved and the lower the standard uh, deviation. Um, it kind of saturates a little bit. We didn't try on enough uh, plants, I would say, to really see this complete flattening of this curve. But uh, we just said if we use training on three plants, it's sufficient. Um, yeah. A bit more interesting results probably the data sets that we acquired. Um, so in total, we acquired um, yeah, these kind of image patches uh, that I talked about earlier of 140 or more than 142,000 different PV modules stemming from 10 different PV plants. And in total, we have uh, 6.55 million of these little patches here because we, uh, on average, get four, about 40 patches per module. Um, and then for the first data, so we actually have two data sets because our camera broke down in the middle of the work. So, and we didn't have calibration data for the old camera. So we worked with two different cameras and two different data sets. Um, yeah, but for the first data set, we obtained uh, two, uh, 10 anomaly labels um, as shown here. Um, yeah, so these ones basically we actually started with 26 anomaly labels and uh, or anomaly classes, and then because for most classes there were very few uh, examples available, and it's quite bad for doing a supervised classification, which I did in the first paper. Uh, so I grouped together the classes depending on their appearance, um, not so much depending on the, the underlying physical cause. So um, this entire study actually works with appearance because deep learning can only look at the appearance of the images. It doesn't really understand the physical causes for this. You need an engineer and uh, someone who knows the, elec the electrical engineering that goes into these modules. And um, those we just also grouped it according to, to appearance. And we have these kind of classes that, um, but some of the classes also allow a one to one mapping to the physical cause. For example, this uh, homogeneously warmer module would mean that the module is disconnected from the plant. You have um, basically all the incoming solar energy needs to be dissipated away in the form of heat, uh, can't be uh, transported away in the form of electrical energy. So um, kind of for some of these classes, you can uh, yeah, see there's one physical cause. For others, you have multiple possible causes. Uh, the second data set, we have only binary labels, so uh, healthy versus some kind of anomaly. Yeah, and uh, from this data set, we could also derive some insights. For example, we uh, saw, um, yeah, you can see here that that's basically the, the percentage of anomalies for every plant in our study. And um, it's actually, I think that's from the first data set only. But uh, yeah, so we see that not all plants have an equal number of or percentage of anomalies. And um, there are some plants that are better kept, like for example, this one. There are others that are more problematic. They have maybe older plants, more problematic modules that uh, suffer from larger. A degree of uh, degradation. So we do see some variation here from say 1% to 12% to 12%. Uh, um, also, we see a quite a class imbalance with respect to the distribution of the different, uh, different anomaly classes. So we have uh, very frequent classes uh, and very infrequent classes um, here. And another interesting insight is that um, 
yeah, and most plants suffer from one or two predominant kind of anomalies. There's no plant that has the entire spectrum of anomalies. Um, each plant has its um, yeah, one or two problem points. <clears throat> um, yeah, that was it about the module detection. Now I'll talk about the module localization and the reporting. So localization was the task of georeferencing each individual um, module in the in the video, and then reporting is the task of yeah, showing it on a map, the results. Um, yeah, so how did I do the, the module localization? Or how do others do it first? Um, so there are a variety of methods that uh, were developed in the recent years. So a very simple one is simply just lock the drone position whenever you see an anomaly in the frame. Um, but it doesn't really allow for accurate localization because you usually have multiple modules per frame. Um, another method that's being used is panorama stitching. Um, so here we would basically manually group the frames that belong to one uh, row of the plant. We would stitch them together into one um, yeah, a larger mosaic of the entire row. And then we could detect the modules in this mosaic and also count them and localize them relative to each other. Um, this method, in, so it does only use visual cues basically to build this um, mosaic. It doesn't really use any additional GPS measurements or something. And it seems to work well for these smaller um, yeah, sequences that I've shown and shorter rows that, that were analyzed. I'm not sure how well it works with like really large plants, like, because you, you would get this uh, buildup of error during the mosaicing procedure. Also, you have to first manually group the frames according to the rows. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how well this would generalize and also how well this can cope with artifacts that are introduced during this mosaicing. I mean, you have to do some kind of image blending, like feathering or something. To, to fuse these individual images. So I'm not sure how this could actually affect downstream anomaly detection or module detection. And this is actually the same problem that the odd photo methods have. So these ones, they fly a bit higher and then they create one single odd photo of the entire plant. Um, here again, I'm a bit skeptical because you would introduce also like some kind of visual artifacts when, when building this auto photo. Um, so I'm not sure how the and module detection and anomaly detection would be then performed on odd photo. So I'm not sure how well these, these would cope. I mean, these artifacts could potentially trigger the anomaly detector, but they're not real anomalies, they're just artifacts that were introduced in this procedure. Um, another method that, that's being used is direct georeferencing. So here we used the um, yeah, GNLS position of the um, flying vehicle and the attitude of the vehicle to assign a um, GPS position to each pixel in the camera. Um, and we can, we can do this doing some transformations of the reference frames here. Um, here I see the problem a little bit that if the GPS position is off because we have some kind of glitch or some, I mean, if you don't see enough satellites in a given moment, uh, you would have a higher error in the position um, positioning. So you would also directly ref uh, yeah, translate this error to the locations of the three modules. Um, a method that, that we used uh, in our works and that I've seen in one other work is uh, structure of motion. So this one here, you would build a 3D con uh, reconstruction of the plant using both the visual cues. So you're kind of yeah, doing multi-view geometry from, from multiple views of the scenery, but you would also uh, take into account the GPS positions. So you would basically, basically match the best of these two worlds of panorama stitching and georeferencing. So you would take the visual cues into account and you would do uh, georeferencing. Um, so you get a good local accuracy, but also good global accuracy. Um, so this method, what it does is actually reconstructs uh, the plant and then performs module and anomaly detection in the 3D reconstruction. Uh, that's a bit problematic. Again, you would have artifacts in this reconstruction. And also it's problematic because uh, you need specialized algorithms that work in these point clouds. Um, I think what we do, and that's probably yeah, more what we do, is we, we do use the structural motion to create a, a map of the plant. But we do perform anomaly detection and module detection in the um, source footage, so the original images. This allows us to use standard algorithms like typical deep learning algorithms for object detection and segmentation classification. Um, but it would also give us the, the advantage of having this 3D reconstruction. So we yeah, pair the best of both worlds here. Um, that's how we do it. So this is our, um, yeah, that's what I showed earlier, the module detection. And now this is how the module localization fits into this uh, framework. So for each video frame, we would uh, extract the GPS coordinates, uh, latitude and longitude. The altitude is not reliable, so we uh, don't use that. Um, we do linear interpolation because the GPS uh, locks with one hertz, the camera with nine hertz. We linearly interpolate to match these rates. Um, and then we need to select a sparse subset of frames because we can't do it possibly on app. We can't perform structure for motion on every um, yeah, frame because we need more, we need a sufficient amount of parallax. 
and this is computationally expensive. It reduce every frame. This would take weeks to compute. So we, we basically uh, select a set of frames based on the travel distance and the intersection over union of the frames. Um, we also need some kind of calibration information for the structure of motion. And if we have these uh, two things, so the frames and the calibration data, we can perform structure for motion. In this case, we use OpenSFM. Um, it's an uh, open source library for structure for motion. And this gives us a um, yeah, sparse uh, 3D point cloud of the scenery that we actually don't need anymore. But what we need is this uh, 60 post trajectory. So the translation and rotation of each uh, camera frame, each uh, keyframe, basically, uh, with respect to one global coordinate origin. And this is in um, uh, geo, geo coordinates, um, yeah, because we use in this uh, OpenSFM the Geo, uh, the GPS coordinates of our trajectory. This basically creates a georeference reconstruction. Um, yeah, and then we take the 3D reconstruction, so the D60 um, post trajectory to triangulate the known corner points of the PV modules from the video frame, so from image coordinates into these world coordinates uh, through triangulation and some further refinement. So we triangulate from every possible pair of uh, keyframes that we see the module in. Then we get, then we average over these uh, multiple reconstructions that we get. Then we perform some iterative improvement of the resulting grid. But basically, this gives us a, a georeference 3D reconstruction of the entire LPV plant. Then we just uh, yeah, map that to the ground plane to get a uh, map like this. Um, I have to say that we don't really take the terrain um, elevation into account here, so we just assume it's flat because yeah, in Germany it's quite flat here, so it works. Not sure where it works in other regions, so you may have to do a bit more sophisticated here with having a digital surface model or digital um, terrain model and project the reconstruction onto that instead of just a flat plane. But for our cases, this worked well. Um, yeah, this is um, an example. So here is uh, basically the, the reconstructed camera trajectory in black and then the reconstructed PV modules in red and their center points in green. Uh, just for a small subset of one larger plant. Um, this here is a entire um, map of a uh, yeah, relatively large plant with about 10 megawatt peaks, so about 13,600 PV modules. And there are some some artifacts, uh, some glitches, but um, yeah, it's more local, not no like global glitches. Uh, the average success rate here is 99.3%, so we miss only a very few, uh, a very small fraction of modules. But I have to say that this procedure is not very robust. I mean, um, so it's kind of like an all or nothing uh, thing here. Uh, if the reconstruction works out, then it looks like this. It's fine. You've got most modules. But in many cases, it also fails because we work in infrared images, which have low resolution and not many features. There's, there's blur through the thermal um, yeah, heat uh, moving in a certain pattern. So these, these are not very optimal conditions for structure for motion. So Either you get all or you don't get anything, and you have to rerun the um, with different settings to open SFM until you get this. So that's maybe something that, that the community could look into improving. Um, yeah. Again, but if it works, it works pretty well, then that's how it looks. And here I also analyzed what's the accuracy of this. So um, we have a total RMSE root mean square error of about 5.9 meters here. Um, that's in the range of GPS, which is expected a 4.9 meter RMSE. Um, yeah, so that's okay, I would say. Um, and as if we uh, look locally, so per row, the RMSE is uh, smaller, it's 22 centimeters to 82 centimeters. So we have uh, yeah, quite a good local accuracy here. That's totally fine for, for our case, uh, use case. Um, you also see that the accuracy here is a bit higher than here. So we have kind of some error drift over the entire reconstruction. Um, I think it, it's, it's fine. Um, here, that's what I said earlier. So we don't really depend on a particular plan layout. We don't really make any assumptions. So we have the ability to, to fly in different configurations, like scan one row, two row, or three rows at a time. And this gives us a um, yeah, means to do a speed accuracy trade-off. So of course, if we fly uh, only one row, we have a higher accuracy because we get higher resolved patches of about 140 times 100 pixels on average. Um, but we have only a throughput of 3.4 modules per second. And we can actually ramp that up to uh, almost 13 modules per second. But then we also have a um, resolution that's only about a third of the size. So here we have to decide what's what's best. Stability of the um, OpenSVM reconstruction was actually best for this case. And this one was also best to fly. It's like easiest to, if you want to like jump, basically if you're done with the row you're here, you have to like go further for the next three rows. That's a bit tricky. You have to count three rows and it was a bit more difficult. 
Uh, this one works pretty well. So this one is actually our favorite configuration for practical applications, I would say. Um, yeah, now the, the last aspect. So I talked about data acquisition, how we find the modules in the video frames, and I talked about how we localize them to create a map of the PV plant. And also interesting, of course, which of the modules are defective. You still can't look at all the data. It's just too many images uh, or it would take hours or days. So you want to do this automatically. And yeah, we have deep learning. We have machine learning. We, we can all use all these methods to, to automate this. Um, and I did, um, but maybe, see, maybe first, what did the others do? Again, we see a lot of works using classic image processing, especially with older works. Um, so again, here, edge detection with Kenny edge detection or thresholding, with fixed thresholds, adaptive thresholds. Again, the same problem, they don't really use much data, so it's not clear how well these methods generalize. Uh, we do see new works using deep learning. Um, for example, this work uses semantic segmentation to pick out um, disconnected strings, so entire yeah, rows of modules that are warmer than the surroundings. Uh, we do uh, see object detection being used, so that basically they do it a bit differently. They, they detect the module and the anomalies in one step. They don't do it as, uh, in two steps how we do it. Um, has, can have advantages. I mean, you have only one neural network, not two. Um, but in my eyes, it also has the disadvantage that you're less flexible because you can't really um, separately tweak the performance of module detection and anomaly detection because both is in one neural network. So if you change the, the network with regard to the anomalies, you will automatically change it with regard to the detection of the modules. So I guess there's pros and cons. Uh, what we use um, and some other works have done that also supervised classification. So we put in the entire image patch and then we predict a um, single label, single class label. Um, I might ask that's the best method because you can distinguish different anomalies. Um, you can um, yeah, see also not here you see only localized anomalies that are like hotspots, for example. But uh, this one is also able to really look at the entire module uh, and then yeah, most anomalies also spread over the entire module area. So I think that classification works works best for this kind of use case. Um, and now this is our data set in numbers. Um, we were lucky to have a lot of raw data available uh, from project partners. So that allowed us to actually achieve state-of-the-art size of our data sets. We, um, maybe to give some reference, like most, no, half of the related works use less than 1,000 modules and images, so relatively small uh, amount of data. But even there are many works that use in the tens of images, so that's really the yeah, I mean, these are the older works, but I, this is where I say I'm skeptical whether these methods even work or generalize. Um, yeah, but okay, everything from here is probably fine. The, the, more, the newer works already have larger amounts of data and the hundreds of thousands of modules, so that's a good development, I would say. Um, yeah, our data set, we had 142,000 modules, and because we have multiple images per module, we actually have almost two orders of magnitude more images. Like The best one has also 150,000 images, I think, about more. Yeah, a little bit less. And then we have uh, 6.55 million images. So, yeah, that's quite a jump here. Uh, in terms of the number of anomaly classes that were analyzed, we had 10 different classes. Um, there's another popular data set uh, that has 11 different classes. Um, yeah, I guess it's important to look at uh, these number of classes because you want to really spot all the anomalies. The, the problematic thing is that many related works actually I look at only one class, so they're only sensitive to one class or even two. But that's too little in my eyes. I mean, you wouldn't really pick out all the important anomalies if you're only sensitive for one or two kinds of anomalies. Um, there are some works that do uh, binary predictions, so they are not able to tell you what anomaly it is, but at least they are sensitive to more anomalies. So that's also fine, I would say. Um, so yeah, we want to look at either classifying many different anomalies or being sensitive to many different anomalies and making binary prediction. Um, also, the number of PV plants, 70% of the studies used only one PV plant. Again, that's critical because we don't know how well it generalizes if the plant layout changes, background, uh, vegetation, whatever. Um, there's some new, or especially new works, who use many more uh, PV plants. Um, that's, that's good. Um, we also use 10 plants, so I think there are some works that use even more. Um, I would say the more the better. Also, an aspect that has to be looked into is the, the resolution of the images. We um, have a GSD, so ground sampling distance of about 1.13 centimeters per pixel. Um, I think these uh, two data sets that I've shown here, um, they have um, about 3 to 15 centimeters. Um, so we have to take into account there is this like IEC, TS, whatever norm for infrared thermography in PV plants. And um, they recommend a worst case resolution of 3 centimeters, so we shouldn't go beyond this. So if you have 15 centimeters uh, resolution, that's too little. 
for doing serious tomography. Um, yeah, this is how this uh, anomaly detection fits into the overall framework. So here we had the module um, detection, here we have the module localization. And now this is uh, how we do the anomaly detection. So we basically, basically take into account these different patches per module, um, do our analysis, and then visualize the results on the respective position in the map. Yeah, we, we know, for example, this bunch of images belongs to this module on the map. We analyze here some defect and we can plot it here. Um, yeah, so I developed three different anomaly detection methods in this work, um, in each publication one. The first one is uh, how most works have done it in the recent times I've seen. Um, the second one is on this problem of domain shift um, that we'll talk about later. And the third one is news deep learning. It's just a physically inspired method um, that has also its advantages. Yeah. So again, our, our task is to basically spot the, or classify either multi class classification or binary classification these uh, different defects based on these image patches. Um, our first work used a ResNet 50 classifier with a softmax layer cross entropy loss, so basically the standard setup of, of, of ImageNet classification uh, to classify these 10 different classes. And um, no, no surprises here, we, we have our confusion matrix. We see that some classes are easier confused than others. Yeah, there's not, nothing surprising. Um, our overall accuracy is 84%. Um, we can actually, so if we use a sing, that's an, an experiment that we did is we used a single patch, so one patch per module, we get 84% accuracy. And now, as I said, we have multiple images per module, we can actually boost the accuracy by almost 7%. Um, so there's an advantage of having multiple patches per module. Um, here, the difference between patch level and module level is that here we really take all the data into account independent of the module assignment, and here we do a majority voting of based on the mo uh, images that belong to the module. So we take this assignment between patches and modules into account. Um, maybe the, there's some class imbalance, so accuracy may not even be the best uh, metric to look into. Uh, the weighted F1 score is probably better for this case, uh, but we see a very similar uh, pattern here. I then also put computed class activation maps using CredCam++. Um, so basically, we, we uh, looked at the regions in the image uh, which the neural network looks at to come to its uh, conclusion when, when doing the prediction. We find that it looks at the warm regions. Um, that's what we would expect. That we, that's what we want to see. So that's all good here. Um, but uh, one one huge problem that we spotted, and I think that's something the community really has to take into account, is the problem of domain shift. So basically, I identified this by plotting the or embedding the images. So we see all these image patches into a low dimensional space um, using UMAP dimensionality reduction. And I found that um, yeah, for each PV plant, we have um, one distinctive cluster here of images. So each point is one image. Yeah. And this clustering is much more um, pronounced than the clustering into normal versus abnormal image patches. And this is problematic. I mean, what we want to see actually is one large cluster for normal and one large cluster for abnormal images that doesn't really uh, yeah, take into account where the image comes from, from which plant. And the problem here is that it's shown on the left. That's how we did it in our first work that I've just shown, and also how most related works have done it, or all related works that I've seen that use some kind of neural network for classification. They sample training and testing uh, uniformly from all clusters. We, we use, like, say, 70% of each cluster for training and 30% of each cluster for testing. So our train and test distributions um, are the same. Um, and or have the same parameters, like the same mean, the same variation. Um, and that's not realistic in my eyes. So that will lead, of course, to a good uh, accuracy because we have the same distributions for training and testing. That's what deep learning is good at. But it's unrealistic. I mean, it would be more realistic to train on one plant or even multiple plants, but then assume that the testing plant, so the one we want to make the predictions on for which we don't have the labels yet, is a distinctive class, a different class, because in practice we want to have our trained network and then we just want to apply it to a new data without having to label parts of that data. Um, yeah, so we have this distributional shift between the training data and the, the target data um, or test data. Yeah, so the, I call it here source and target because this problem is called unsupervised domain adaptation and they usually talk about source and target data uh, because you want to train on the source and then transfer to the target. And yeah, so, so it's important to take this into account. And I think this is something the community should stop doing it like this. You should really do it like this instead. Um, there is a yeah, whole breadth of methods that could be used to kind of tackle this uh, domain shift here. 
I did the first step. I mean, I didn't really solve the problem. I only proposed one solution that worked a little bit better than the normal cross entropy classifier. Uh, it's definitely not a the final solution, and I think there's a lot of work that could be done still here to really tackle that problem and improve accuracy in, in considering this uh, domain gap. So my solution or partial solution is to use a contrastive loss instead of a cross entropy loss, because uh, there's a very popular work that has shown that uh, contrastive representations are more informative than cross entropy representations. And this higher informativeness uh, should lead to a better, uh, yeah, better performance in, in the presence of this distributional shift. And um, yeah, so how I did it is basically I trained a CNN on our source images, our training images that are labeled, and I trained it to produce embeddings that uh, cluster our data into normal and abnormal uh, clusters, independent of the origin plant that the images come from. Uh, I did so using a supervised contrastive loss. Um, and yeah, then basically I used this trained CNN to embed the target images for which we want to predict the labels. I also embedded the training images, and then I have this space where I have both the tar unlabeled target uh, features and the, the labeled training features. And now we just did KNN classification to get the yeah, labels of each uh, or the, the predictions for each uh, target image based on the neighboring training images. And um, yeah, again, I mean this should do better with the contrastive uh, with the domain shift because these contrastive representations are more informative than. As if we had used a cross entropy loss here, because cross entropy loss tries to really um, extremely uh, maximize the, the in interclass uh, margin and reduce the, the int intraclass uh, variance. So, really tries to compress the data into one point and put the points of the different classes very far away. But it leads to features that are not really rep uh, representative. The, the um, contrastive features are a bit more spread out and thus carry more information, not as compressed, I would say. That's also what this, this work found. Um, yeah, and then, then if we look at the results, so these are the feature spaces that we obtained after training with the contrasted loss. So now we have our distinctive uh, nominal cluster, abnormal cluster, which doesn't really show these uh, different original or plants from which the data originates from anymore. There are some cases like here, we do see still the clusters um, from the original plant, but we also have this clear separation between nominal and abnormal. And uh, we also looked here at um, different pairings of target and source plants. Um, found that this matters, of course, so you have to make a clever choice of your training plan if you want to do this. Uh, and uh, basically, just choose the plan with more data, more anomalies. That, that basically use the plan for training that is most challenging, and then you would expect higher accuracy on the testing. Um, yeah, uh, here for example, we used this plant to show uh, poor performance, and we found that it's because it has just 4.6 less data. 4.6 times less data than plants A or B. Yeah, so that's something to take into account. Um, here we actually quantitatively compared it with the cross entropy classifier and we see an improvement in the accuracy for some of our tasks. So this is always like um, a pairing of source and target plant, right? So we trained on plant A, we tested on plant B. Uh, for these two cases, we see an improvement in many cases, not always. Um, yeah. And uh, for plan F, which as I said has le less data, we actually see that the cross entropy works better than our method. So, as I said, I partially solved this problem with the domain shift. I'm not 100% sure if this contrastive method is really a solution to it. Um, I think that the core message of this work was really like uh, to look at this domain shift and try to find solutions for it. Um, yeah, so my solution should be taken with a grain of salt. Yes. Uh, what another aspect that I think is very important that the community has to look into is this detection of unknown anomalies. Um, so I said there, the, what I showed earlier, the distribution of anomalies is very imbalanced. So we have some very uh, infrequent anomalies with very frequent ones. And so it's, um, yeah, we should assume that uh, we would spot new anomalies in the future that we haven't encountered during training yet. And um, so it's important that the method actually also picks out these unknown anomalies that are not part of the training data set, but that may occur in, in practice. And in order to test this uh, ability of this cross entropy method now, I picked out uh, these anomalies, so five of the 10 classes from the training set. So our training set contains only five anomaly classes. The test set still contains all anomaly classes. And then I trained the method and evaluated it on the entire um, full set of anomalies. And interestingly, I don't see a drop in accuracy here. So it shows the method actually works well on um, yeah, picking out this data. 
It will be interesting to see how the cross entropy classifier does here. Uh, I didn't test it. Could be interesting to figure out if it can do the same, right? If it's possible to train only on five classes, but still be able to to pick out all ten classes. Um, also, some as some aspect that I have to mention here. I picked out these five classes because they have, uh, I think, in total only about five percent is only five percent of the data in our uh, training set. The other ninety-five percent belong to the other five classes, and I did so because I didn't want to um, skew the experiment by picking out too much data. Because if I had picked out the classes that are very represented, then I would have uh, removed large amounts of the training data, and it probably would have uh, then dropped the accuracy. But then we would have seen only this drop due to the lower amount of data, but not due to the being uh, these classes not being part of the data set anymore. Um, and now the, the last method from my third publication on module anomaly detection. I said is a non-deep learning method, a physically inspired method. Um, it simply looks at the distribution of the module temperatures over the entire plant, um, which is shown here for this uh, large plant with 13,600 modules. And now we show the maximum module temperatures. Uh, maximum here means uh, the maximum over the entire image patch of each module. So basically we have our 140 times 100 pixel image patch, and now we look at the brightest pixel. And this is the value that we show here. And now what we see here is, um, first of all, a global pattern. So this entire recording took about two hours. Um, I mean, here, so this started at about 10.30 a.m. It went all the way to 12.30 p.m. And uh, of course, the air temperature changed, the cloud cover changed. Um, so we see that in the morning it was cooler and then later it got a bit warmer. Uh, probably also the cloud cover was different. That's maybe these smaller uh, hot patches. Here's a bit warmer, here's a bit warmer, here's a bit warmer here again. Um, yeah, so that there's some global pattern that kind of prevents us from saying, okay, we want to make a cutoff at 45 uh, degrees Celsius and everything that's higher than that is an anomaly. Uh, we can't do that. Um, Instead, we have to, maybe one aspect before I explain this, uh, one aspect is in this distribution, we can actually spot system anomalies like uh, open strings like here, uh, which we couldn't do with the deep learning because the deep learning looks at individual modules only. Uh, my deep learning methods. I mean, there would be also, there are other methods that look at entire strings and stuff, but my method will only be able to pick out individual module anomalies, not system anomalies. Um, but now again, uh, we can't say we have this threshold value and then we cut off and then everything that's warmer is an anomaly. Instead, we have to get rid of this global distribution. And now without this global distribution, um, we have basically a homogeneous mean temperature. Now we can say, okay, make a cutoff at uh, 2.5 Kelvin difference and then that's all anomalous. How did I compute this? Basically, I just uh, subtracted from each module temperature that was shown here the um, uh, median of the surrounding modules. Uh, surrounding means a circle of seven meter radius that was arbitrarily chosen. Um, and this gives us basically a, a local temperature difference. So basically this now indicates how much warmer is this module than the median of the surrounding modules. And this picks out very nicely the um, yeah, modules that have uh, hot spots or, hot, or some terminal anomalies. And now we can really say we have threshold value of 2.5 Kelvin or something and then we get all the detections. Um, so now I compared this temperature distribution with the deep learning classifier. This deep learning classifier is from my second publication, the cross entropy classifier. Um, and we see actually the overall area under the receiver operating curve is not much worse, about 4%. Um, interestingly, we see that um, the com they complement each other. So the deep learning classifier is good as some classes where the temperature distribution is not as good as detecting and vice versa. So for instance, the deep learning one is good at uh, detecting PID or substring anomalies that basically spread over the entire module area but have a low temperature gradient. And because of this low temperature gradient, this method doesn't work as well. But this one works well on, on uh, kind of anomalies that have high gradients like um, but are small in spatial extent. And the CNN is not as good in detecting the uh, anomalies with small spatial extent, like the hot junction box, hot spots, or soiling or something, yeah, because they're just too small in the image. Um, but the temperature gradient is high, so the, this method is good at this. So ideally, we would combine both methods, and if we want to really make a real-world uh, software that picks out anomalies, we should use both. Um, I also have to say, this one is only slightly better, but it's also relatively low-performant. Uh, the neural network we use the ResNet 18 here. I think it's also only trained on one PV plant. Um, so there could be a lot of gain by using a more advanced neural network here with more data. Uh, so whereas here we kind of we hit the limit, we can't prove this anymore. On the other hand, this one can detect open string anomalies, um, 
Yeah, so this one is a separate module. This one can also detect system anomalies. And it doesn't really suffer from the domain shift because it doesn't use any data. Um, but then again, because it doesn't use data, it is using manual heuristics like this seven meter radius and things. So yeah, there's a trade-off to be made here. Um, yeah. And then let's, uh, let me conclude. So this entire method that I developed, it allowed us in our institute to use the available raw infrared videos um, that previously were just dumped on the server and no one could work with it. Um, I made it yeah, accessible to, to research. Um, I developed an entire software solution for performing targeted repairs in large-scale PV plants. Um, yeah, and this method is high throughput. It achieved about 10.6 uh, megawatt peak per hour in throughput, uh, which is much more than any menu method or uh, ground-based robot could have done, I guess. Um, yeah, and, and uh, I published this, not, not only the scientific results in my publications, but also these two software packages that are available on my GitHub page, as shown here. Um, one is called PVHawk, that's the computer vision pipeline, it's a command line tool written in Python, and a um, desktop app uh, called PVHawk Viewer that can be used to browse the resulting data sets, uh, annotate uh, module defects, annotate electrical connectivity. Um, yeah, this is a desktop app implemented with uh, Qt for Python. Um, I didn't provide a web app, um, will probably be the next step. Yeah, but uh, for this case, the, the desktop was just fine. Um, now to give an outlook, that's probably the most interesting aspect because it shows what the field could do to improve this method. Um, it's it's, it's uh, structured into module detection, anomaly detection, module localization, and reporting again. Um, one aspect is, um, yeah, we, we did perform instant segmentation only on per frame basis, but we could have also used some video um, detection method to do it to take this temporal uh, information into account. Maybe, not sure if this is a really good idea, but we could also provide an end-to-end -end solution to get to picking out the patches from the video instead of having these different algorithms like uh, master RCN and then multi-object tracker, then uh, some kind of mapping could probably be done in one neural network. Not sure if it's a good idea. Um, anomaly detection here is important that we um, yeah make this method future-proof, so um, let it be able, or make it able to work on different module technologies. We only look, took polycrystalline silicon modules into account that are currently the most popular, I think 95% uh, share. But in the future, we'd probably see more thin film, half cell, shingling modules, uh, two phase modules, whatever. Uh, the method should be extended to this. Also, um, interesting aspects are not only these thermal anomalies, but also degree of soiling um, or geometric misalignments that occur during the installation of the plant. Um, also, there it's a huge family of, of um, anomaly detection modules and uh, models that perform segmentation in an unsupervised manner of the anomalies. Uh, for example, PADIM is one of these, uh, could be a good starting point to look at this paper. Um, yeah, that could be used instead of the supervised classification of anomalies. Um, also, as I said, the domain adaptation, I only proposed an initial solution, a partial solution. There are many active domain adaptation methods using, for example, um, um, maximum mean discrepancy loss could be a starting point for this. Um, also, I didn't really take bias or class imbalance into account. Bias in the sense we only one person labeled our data set. Uh, class imbalance, uh, I said anomalies have a high, some are frequent, some are less frequent. Um, also, one a huge aspect is this electrical connectivity to take this into account, because this would allow us, as shown here, to, to report um, or match the imagery to the electrical uh, parameters of the plant. And in order to get these electrical um, yeah, information how these modules uh, relate to each other in the plant. It, it, currently, we need to manually enter this information because there's no standardized cut formats that or digital formats that would describe this connection. And it's something the industry should develop um, to give us yeah, a way to automatically ingest this kind of uh, information. Also, I only looked at the typical plants that we have in Germany, so these like, uh, row-based plants. Um, I did try a little bit with a rooftop plant, but not really seriously. So it would be important to also look at rooftop plants and, and floating PV plants, which are popular in Southeast Asia, for example. Um, yeah, these methods, uh, or my methods should be extended to this. Again, then a very important aspect is not only spotting which modules are anomalous, but also identifying how serious is the anomaly. So how much do we lose actually in terms of power and yield? And for this, we need to look at both the imagery and the electrical data. And we also need to know how the modules are connected. That's this aspect with the electrical layout. 
then we need to find correlations here and kind of analyze how important are these anomalies actually, because we don't want to actually give an alert if the anomaly doesn't actually lead to a power loss or yield loss. Also, um, now we had this map uh, shown earlier of, of, uh, where we showed which modules are defective. Um, it, it would probably be cool to have a handheld device, a phone app or tablet app, and also localize the repair crew and the plant so that you, the crew can already walk to the defective module and knows where where they are in the plant, because the plants are so huge, you don't know where you are if you're you know, standing on one of those. Um, so that's that's a little improvement that could be made. Um, also, I only work with infrared. Later on, I actually extended it to RGB already. Some students uh, extended the approach to electroluminescence and photoluminescence. Uh, one aspect that I want to mention that would be very useful, I guess, is to perform all these uh, computer vision methods like module detection, structure of emotion, perform all this in the RGB footage because the RGB has higher resolution, has more textures, is uh, sharper than the thermal image. And so it would be very helpful to, to do all these analysis in the visual footage and then have a mapping from visual to RG, uh, to thermal and only crop out from the thermal in the end. That would be the, the ideal and the way to go. Unluckily it didn't work with our camera because the camera was not really, it wasn't possible to uh, temporarily synchronize it and spatially register the two video streams because it's a microbolometer or terminal camera, so it's free running and the, the frame rate is not constant. It performs flat field calibration in intermittent intervals. So there's some kind of jump in the footage. So it's really, really a tough problem to synchronize these. But if that was possible due to better sensors or a better software, then that would be the way to go, I would say. Yeah, so that, that's basically, let me conclude this. That was the talk. Um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. Have a good day.